Welcome to today's lecture on motor development theories and principles. My name is Kendra Ganyan. I am a pediatric physical therapist and a professor of physical therapy. So today we're going to cover kind of three main objectives. First, we're going to discuss the three theories of motor development and how they influence the practice of pediatric physical therapy. We're going to identify components of typical motor development and also describe general principles in the development of reach, grasp, postural, and mobility control. So you may have studied motor development in the past, and when you did, the focus was likely on motor milestones. So things like you see this little guy doing here, sitting up, starting to take a few steps, walking with support. And milestones are certainly important kind of markers of motor development, and they're critically important for physical therapists and physical therapist assistants to understand. But today we want to dive a little bit deeper and talk more about more than milestones. So we're really going to focus today on how motor skills emerge. And this is important because understanding how motor skills emerge can first of all make our predictions more accurate. Um, if we know more than just the order of which motor skills develop, um, we actually understand kind of quality of movement and how skills build on top of one another. We can, we can better predict kind of where kids are going next. It also allows us to analyze gaps and formulate a plan to fill the gaps. So again, understanding that quality of movement, understanding the difference between a child who is um, developing their motor skills in a sort of typical order and fashion and just delayed versus a child who's really exhibiting some abnormal motor skills or some scattering of skills. Those things are really important things to understand so that you really understand what the gaps are and how you can best address those issues. And finally, understanding how motor skills emerge provides us with an understanding of the multiple variables involved in skill development. So it forces us and helps us think more broadly about motor development than just a, a set of skills that develop in this sort of linear um, block by block fashion. But we start to understand all of the different things that influence skill development um, all of the different ways that children learn to move, and then this results in more versatile and individual interventions for those kiddos. So let's start with just a brief discussion of developmental theory. And, you know, this is a really vast area of study. There's tons of literature out there, so we are just going to not even scratch the surface today. But a helpful way to think about the different developmental theories is to really think about that nature versus nurture debate, if you've ever heard of that. So is our behavior and the way we develop because of nature, because of just the way that we were made, the way that we're hardwired as humans, as people, or is the way that we behave and develop the result of nurture, our environment, the home we grew up in, our parents and our families and our siblings? And so this is kind of that classic debate, right? Nature versus nurture. And so developmental theory kind of um, parallels that debate. So first of all, the neural maturationist theory, that's the theory that pediatric physical therapy was really built upon, and it would really fall on the nature side of the debate. So neural maturationist theory sort of said that development was driven by brain development, that the brain was hardwired to develop in a certain way, and so our behavior and our motor development as humans happens in this very hierarchical, linear, uh, very predictive, and also um, you know, sort of consistent way just based on brain development. Cognitive theory sort of hits the nurture side of the debate. So cognitive theory says that development and behavior really develops because of the individual's interaction with the environment, um, learning that we do things and we see a result and that that teaches us to either do it again or not do it again or do it differently. So it's very much, again, on the nurture side of the debate. And so the most contemporary theory, dynamical systems theory, um, sort of blends those things together. So dynamical systems theory was pioneered by a physical therapist called, uh, named Esther Thielen in the 90s. 
And this theory really says there's not one single primary influence that drives developmental change. It's not just the brain developing, but it's also not just your environment. Dynamical systems theory says that development of movement depends on a combination of factors that both pers the factors within the person, so things like body shape and size and development of the brain, um, perceptual factors, cognitive factors, but the development also is very much influenced by environmental contributions as well. So dynamical systems theory, again, is the most contemporary theory of motor development. It's what most of um, the literature and what we discuss now is built upon. And really just um, to really drill it down just says that motor development is driven by the person, the environment, the body, the brain, perception, all of those things come together to create movement and motor behavior. There's also been a lot of work in the last couple of decades about this idea of motor learning. And motor learning um, really has some sort of primary um, principles that I wanna to talk to you about today. So first of all, a big part of motor learning is about practice. So motor skill acquisition results from repetition of, acts, of action and really is a process of learning rules to evaluate, correct, and update memory traces for a given movement. So a perfect example of this is this sort of abstract I have embedded in this slide, some recent work by um, Karen Adolf and her colleagues. And basically what they did in the study is they put markers on toddlers who were just learning to walk and they filmed them and they basically just traced all of their movements in, in this room and um, did all of these kind of complex computer analyses of the movement. But what they found was um, really astonishing. So children who are learning to walk averaged 2,368 steps and 17 falls per hour. And when you really think about this, over a time of you know six to eight hours of social mobility a day, I mean, this is tens of thousands of steps every day and week, and probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of steps that accumulate over the time of learning to walk. And so I think this just, and these are typically developing children, but this just underscores how much practice it takes for motor learning. That trial and error practice evaluating, correcting, and updating your, your memory traces um, leads to that development of motor programs. And then those motor programs, recall schemas, so in other words, um, memories of your relationships between past movements and the outcomes they produced, and also recognition schemas, so relationships between past movements and the sensory consequences, so how did it feel? Um, all of those things work together to build motor experience. And again, it takes an enormous amount of practice and it takes an enormous amount of time. So this is a really important kind of fundamental piece of understanding motor development. There are also a few kind of big developmental principles that we want you to understand. Developmental direction, um, neural maturation, which we sort of touched on already, sensitive periods and stages of motor development. So developmental direction is an important thing to understand. Development occurs in a head-to-toe direction or cephalocaudal direction. And so this little figure on the right here of this slide sort of shows a child progressing from de uh, through their development from age 0 to 18 months. And so you can see baby first develops head control, so starts to lift head. Then baby develops sort of trunk control and so is able to start to sit up and move in and out of sitting and then eventually gains um, hip and lower extremity control that allows for pulling to stand, cruising, and walking. And so it's pre very, quite predictable um, that children do tend to develop in this head-to-toe direction. And the but the specific kind of rate and way in which that development happens can be can be a little bit variable and is often dictated by muscle strength and anthropometric characteristics. So a great example of this is um, when babies are born, their heads are very large relative to their bodies. Humans are smart animals, which means we need to be born with really big brains. 
And so that means that our that, that our heads are quite large relative to our body, um, especially compared to other species. And so that's why it's so hard to hold our heads up when we're babies. Our heads are big and heavy. Furthermore, we haven't developed that muscle strength yet. So it takes a lot of practice and a lot of strengthening to learn to lift that head. Um, once baby learns to lift the head, often those first rolls happen because baby starts to shift weight on their tummy and that big heavy head shifts to one side or another just a little bit too far and baby flips over. And you know, similarly, the big challenge in learning to walk is really learning to balance that large head over a smaller base of support. And so children who, are, who have relatively large heads um, may walk a little bit late, or if they have smaller bodies relative to their head, they may walk a little bit later. If they're shorter, they may walk a little bit earlier because their center of uh, mass isn't quite as high. So there are those little details about us that, that make um, our development unique, but it does tend to develop for everyone in that head to toe fashion. Development also happens in a proximodistal fashion, so inside out. So again, we gain kind of our core muscle control before we can use our arms and hands and legs. So again, sitting is a perfect example of this. When a baby first learns to sit, it takes all of the energy that he has to hold, just hold his head and trunk upright. If you try to hand him a toy, if he tries to wiggle his legs, um, he'll lose that immediately. And so he has to develop that good core proximal stability before he can um, have distal mobility. And that's why often proximal dysfunction can mask those distal abilities. So if you think about it, if you can't sit up straight and hold yourself up, um, you, may, you may be able to use your hands, but you probably aren't going to be able to because you don't have that postural control. And this slide kind of illustrates that. So um, just to kind of build on that idea, postural control is really the core ingredient for motor skill. If we don't have good trunk control, good postural control, um, all of those other motor skills are just really not going to emerge. And so um, good example here in this photo, here's a baby. And on the right, baby is being supported. So this is you know maybe a newborn baby that hasn't learned to um, hold up his head or trunk yet. And so when an adult, when a therapist provides external support, baby's head is midline, eye contact is good, hands are relaxed. Um, you know, you feel like looking at that image that he could probably kind of bat at a toy. So able to kind of control the, um, you know, the face and arms and legs because they're, he's being provided with that proximal stability. When the therapist or adult moves their hands away, lowers the hands, takes away that proximal stability, that, that artificial postural control, all of a sudden baby looks disorganized, unable to make eye contact, unable to learn. I'm guessing you wouldn't be able to feed like that, probably not able to bat at a toy. So this is a perfect example um, of how our kiddos who, have, who, who don't have that good muscle control or postural stability um, really also are losing out on the ability to um, develop distal mobility or frankly show uh, um, and use the distal abilities that they have. Postural control, it has a really heavy sensory component and involves cooperation between visual, so the, um, the eyes and gaze. So we use that visual, visual um, information for feedback, correction, so and also feed forward anticipatory control. Uh, we also use for postural control the somatosensory system, and so this is kind of that system that, that triggers body positioning and writing and kind of forces us or causes us to naturally kind of try to correct ourselves and stay upright. And also the vestibular system, which regulates head control and kind of keep, gives us a reference to gravity. So again, also kind of helps us stay upright and gives us that natural sort of tendency when we do lose our balance um, or get pushed outside of our base of support to try to come upright. And I've already kind of touched on this, but just to sort of reiterate it, delayed or abnormal development of postural system can actually constrain that child's ability to develop independence and mobility and manipulatory skills. So again, this is, this is core, this is foundational, um, and really important for development of motor skills.
One of the most common questions that families ask us is when will my child walk? And that really gets at the development of locomotion control. We know that most children will walk between nine to 15 months of age. The average age of first steps is about 11 and a half months. So roughly around the first birthday, children start to take some steps. And again, 90% walk by 15 months. Now that means there's still 10% of typically developing kids that walk later. So a child who walks after 15 months does not necessarily mean something's wrong, but it might raise that sort of at least yellow flag, if not red flag, that we might want to look more closely, make sure that there isn't something going on. Joint angles and gait parameters are adult-like relative to stature by about age three. So uh, gait development happens quite rapidly. Um, between kind of ages 12 to 18 months, we really sort of learn to walk. And then by age three, we have a pretty mature gait pattern. And it's really fully mature by about age seven. Reach grasp is also something really important for us to understand. Um, newborns do move their arms and it doesn't, uh, it really appears to the, the naked eye or the untrained eye to be sort of random, but studies have shown that newborn arm movements actually do appear to be purposeful. And so newborns are trying to um, reach bad at something. Very young infants will reach by sort of aiming their hand toward the target. So just kind of batting. So you think about when you see babies that really just kind of bat at toys. Um, they're not using a lot of uh, feed forward control. They're just sort of visually finding the object and just sort of shooting their hands toward it. And then once they get close to the object or once they contact the object, then they use that information to try to refine. So you see those really jerky kind of end range movements, um, and that's how that early development of reach grasp is happening. By age five to six months, um, the infants have um, a lot better visual skills. So when we're born, we only can really see about eight to 12 inches in front of us, and um, our vision is really poor. We see mostly black and white, mostly shadows, very blurry. That really changes in the first five to six months. And so by five or six months, our vision is much better. And so then we can start using our visual information for that um, feed forward control. So reaching becomes straighter and more controlled. It becomes less of just a batted in object and then correction later and, and more of a controlled um, and targeted motion. Babies tend to um, use both hands and reach by, with, by manual reaching until about six or seven months. So often when you hand them something, both of those hands will come together and they should. Kind of hands to midline, hands together, midline control is actually a really important motor skill in those first six months. Um, but obviously as we develop, we do need to be able to use our hands individually and even do some complementary by manual reaching. So move objects from hand to hand. And that sort of um, starts to emerge by eight to 10 months. And we don't talk a whole lot about facial actions in uh, physical therapist practice, but it's important for us to understand, and we may work closely with other professionals like occupational therapists or um, assistants or speech language um, professionals on this, but it is important for us to understand that facial actions are so important and they are really the basis of fundamental social skills, eating, communicating, and looking. And they really are... Um, some of the most complex movements we ever learn. So early on, coordinating suck, swallow, breathe is critical for infants to be able to nurse and feed without choking and swallowing air. And often our newborns, our preemies, um, that's a real challenge for them. It's an incredibly complicated skill. And so that's a very early on. So if you, if you have any experience in you know, neonatal environments, that often is a big focus. We know that fetuses and newborns actually do use their facial muscles to make expressions, to communicate. So um, strong stimuli will produce grimaces and, um, and those, facial character, or those facial kind of expressions. Social smiling and laughter emerges usually by two to five months, usually closer to two to three months, but babies start to be able to, to engage socially um, using their facial muscles and expressions, um, usually by, by that two to five month period. And speech production, you know, obviously starts to occur at about age one. 
very similarly to um, kind of when walking happens. So those things start to happen sort of in parallel. Now babies can understand speech much, much earlier than that and obviously start to produce babbling noises, um, coos and all those things much earlier. But actual speech and words tend to start by about a year old. And again, going back to that idea of motor learning and practice, infants amass an enormous amount of practice learning to look. In one day, infants shift their gaze about 50,000 times. And, you know, just a couple of more things I want to hit on here. You know, this idea of sensitive periods is a big one in the literature. Sensitive periods might be identified as a time when children vary in their selection of a movement strategy in response to a particular task. And so um, we think this might be the result of experience-dependent nervous system maturation, so that use-it-or-lose-it phenomenon. When we're babies, we produce tons and tons of neural co co um, connections, way more than we'll ever need. And based on our experiences, those neural connections are either strengthened or they die away. And so there's some thought that this idea of sensitive periods could be that moment um, when we have tons and tons of overproduction of synapses but before those ones that aren't used are, are pruned away. So again, we know that the brain is plastic throughout life now. It's not at all to suggest that, um, that there's truly a use it or lose it time or a window that closes, but there may be strategic times where an interventions may be the most effective. And I you know, kind of touched on this earlier, but when we think about motor development and especially this idea of motor milestones, it's important to remember a few things. Development is not linear. It really happens in more of a spiral pattern. And so sometimes children develop and they regress to an earlier form of a behavior as, as more mature skills emerge. So a perfect example is um, crawling and creeping. So babies will start to army crawl using a reciprocal arm mo movements and they'll get really good and really fast. But when they start to come up on hands and knees, they may lose that reciprocal arm movement and return to more of a... Um, a discoordinated arm movements and before they go back to that reciprocal movement. Those periods of instability or disequilibrium do drive the developmental process. So again, those, those unstable periods, those periods when we're going from learning to, when we're learning to crawl or we're transitioning from learning to crawl to learning to walk. And those may kind of parallel those sensitive periods. So again, there may be times when motor interventions are more effective and we think those times are when motor skills are least stable. And it's important to remember that movement and development is highly variable and something that's critically important to, develop, to remember is that the, our idea of stages of motor development or motor milestones are really pretty arbitrary and rooted in what we call weird cultures. So Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic cultures. So essentially, you know, what we think of as typical motor development is, is, is typical motor development for our culture. But what we're learning now is that cultures all over, in cultures all over the world, children experience motor development really differently and don't necessarily hit all those same milestones, and that's okay. And just a few words about play. Um, play is such a powerful um, form of movement and motor skill, and we learn so much through play. In infancy, children engage in rep rep repetitive motor activities without an obvious purpose or goal. So this type of play peaks at around six months of age. So we just move for the sake of moving, and there's not really any, any gender differences there. By about one year, exercise play begins. So we run, we jump, we, we climb that peaks in preschool years and really promotes strength and endurance. And we see that, that boys engage in more exercise play than girls. And whether that's hardwired or that's environmental and societal is, is unclear. It's probably a mix. And then similarly, rough and tumble play, so the wrestling, kicking, tumbling, um, increases through preschool and peaks just before adolescence. And so again, boys do this more than girls and this is thought to serve a social function. And finally, just to kind of wrap us up today, uh, you know, really just want to um, underscore this idea of the power of movement and mobility. And a few main points I want you to take away from today. Posture is the basis for locomotion, reach, grasp, and facial action. You have to start with posture. Experience is necessary for learning motor behaviors. 
And it, typically developing infants accumulate a tremendous amount of experience as they develop movement. So kids who aren't able to do that, who maybe have disabilities, um, we have to work really hard to give them that practice. Perception guides movement and movement creates perception. So um, our movements not only um, impact how we interact with the world, but it impacts how the world interacts with us. And motor development um, provides that always opportunities for acquiring knowledge about the world and can result in changes in perceptual, cognitive, and social domains. So movement is about so much more than just movement. And if you're not thinking about cognition and social and sensory and perceptual and just um, just the idea of exploration and social mobility, then you're really missing the whole boat. And here are some of the references that I pulled for this discussion today. Um, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time.